Now, this morning, I want to start with a series of studies with you that I believe is very important, especially for where the Church of Jesus Christ is at in these days. I believe that if Jesus walked the earth today and he had a television interview by some Christian news organization, he would say the exact same things today about the church as he did here in Matthew 23 to the church of his day. I believe that with all my heart. The church is in great turmoil, great difficulty today. And you have heard me say this many times, and I'm going to continue to say it. You need to be praying for an awakening in the church because I believe the church is filled with a bunch of pretenders and not individuals who are fully serving and seeking Him. And I don't want to be one of those pretenders. And I don't want this church to be a a pretender. I want us to be men and women who are truly being transformed by the power of God's Word and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so this is why I want to do this series of studies with you on this subject. Jesus here in Matthew 23 gives one of the most stinging rebukes that we have recorded in Scripture. He rebukes the Pharisees and their hypocrisy. He calls them hypocrites seven times in this particular message. It begins in verse 13 where he says, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Now, do you know what the word hypocrite means? It means to be an actor. It was a, the same word used for a stage actor. It can be also translated pretender, somebody who pretends, somebody who is just acting out, doing the external things, but not really having a sincere heart that is changed by the Lord. And so he is warning, and a tremendous warning here, to all that read it. And I, I pray that every one of us will be warned. I pray that as this passage stung me, I hope it will sting you. I was reading this in my devotions one day, and I'm just telling you, the, the Holy Spirit began to speak to me, and just he was warning me. He was speaking to my heart, and I hope that he will do the same with you. I would encourage you to examine yourself today and determine, do you have true religion or do you have false religion or a little bit of both? Now, in our passage here, let's read James chapter 1 first, where he defines what true and false religion is which is the same definition that Jesus declares in Matthew 23. Chapter 1 of James, verse 26, he says, If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Now, many times people read this and they, they say, Oh, religion. Oh, I don't like that word. I, I, have, I don't have religion. I got relationship. And that's a good statement. But you know what the word religion means? It means to be a worshiper. In fact, the same Greek word is translated worshiper, in other places in the New Testament. So what James is addressing here is he said to be a true and undefiled worshiper. If you think you're a true worshiper, then you need to bridle your tongue. You need to have some action. You need to control your your lips. And then he says if you're a if you want this pure and undefiled worship experience in your life, then you have to take care of the neediest individuals, which means 
as he describes here, visiting orphans and widows in their trouble. And then keep yourself from being spotted by the world. In other words, holiness. I need to be a changed individual, not one tainted by the world. Now, go back with me to Matthew 23 and our text here this morning. Let us read what Jesus said. Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works. For they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. They love the best places at feasts and the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi, or Teacher, Teacher. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your Teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on the earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. So what Jesus does here is he addresses whom? Who is he talking to here? This is important to address and to know. He says here, he spoke to the multitudes and to the disciples. So all the people that were following him and his disciples standing in front of them, he said, you know what? I don't want you to be like these guys. I want you to be as different as you possibly can from these individuals because they're hypocrites. They're actors. They're pretenders. They are not truly changed individuals. And so he's saying, I want you to be different. And he gives here a definition of how they are to be different. Now remember, I've said this to you many times. It's easy to tell somebody what to do. But then they don't, a person doesn't time, many times tell you what, how to do it. You see, it's easy to say, this is what you should do. But how do you become that way? That's the question. And so what Jesus does is he tells them how here. This is so practical, and it's so important for every one of us in this room to take this and apply it in our own individual lives because he wants to change us. Now, Jesus is extremely hard on these individuals. I think it is essential to understand why. Why was Jesus so hard on these men? Why does he say such incredibly stinging things that just he just rebukes them? He calls them hypocrites. He tells them that their damnation is just. I mean, these are hard things to say, but they need to be said. And he says them because he hates false religion. He hates it. He hates it with everything he has within him because it destroys the people that are around them. It destroy and it will destroy the church. I believe that the hypocrisy that he is talking about here is the very thing that is destroying the church today. It's hypocrisy. That's the point. In Luke chapter 12, verse 1, Jesus said there, He spoke to his disciples and he said, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Now notice, he said, this is the crux of it. This is the issue. Again, that's why he says to them seven times in this one chapter, he calls them hypocrites. You're actors, you're pretenders. So why is he saying this? Because hypocrisy is like leaven. 
Now, what is leaven? Leaven is that element that you put into bread, and it puffs it up. And you let the bread rise, and then you smash it down. And then you let it rise, and you smash it down. Let it rise, and then you bake it. What happens to leaven when you do that? Well, it permeates every fiber of that bread dough. Now, we are that bread dough. You see, that you personally and the church as a, as a whole, and we are either being permeated by hypocrisy or we are being permeated by the truth and the reality of Christ. One or the other. Because the leaven will surely permeate your life. And it starts in one little place and then it proceeds to take over the rest. This is why a Christian can start out really good and then they slowly decline in their Christian experience. And every one of us in this room can experience that decline. And it's because we allow a little leaven to leaven the entire lump. And that is something that the Lord does not want because it makes us to end up being false worshipers, actors, pretenders. This is what he said in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 12 through 15, to the people of God in Isaiah's time. He said, when you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons and the Sabbaths and the calling of assemblies. I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Not he cannot hear. He said, I will not hear. He says, your hands are full of blood. Now, what does he mean by that last statement? Well, these same worshipers were sacrificing their children to the God of Baal and Molech. And yet they came and worshipped him at the same time. And that's why the Lord says, who asked you to come? I don't want you coming. I don't want you bringing futile sacrifices. And then he just straight up says, my soul hates this. So there are several places in the Old Testament and in the New where we have this understanding of what God hates. The key to this passage is he says, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. You see, he's saying, you're coming here with this iniquity in your life, you're, you're a pretender, and yet you're coming acting all spiritual when you come into my courts. And you bring your sacrifices and you do your thing. But he goes, I don't want it. I don't, I don't want that. I want a changed individual. And that is what the Lord is after in the church. That is what he wants today. And so... This is what we have to address in this particular text here this morning. So, are you an actor? Or are you walking in a true way? Are you pretending, going through the external motions? Would the Lord say, if he, if he stood behind me while I was on my computer, and no one else is in the house. Would he say, I don't, I don't think you should be looking at that stuff, Steve. Or would he say, you made a good choice to click out of that. If he went with me to the movies, would he get up and walk out? Or would he say, this, is, this has got a good theme. This is something that I think is encouraging and would build you up. If he lived in the spare bedroom of my house, 
Would he call me a true believer? Or would he say, Steve, you're a Pharisee? Because you don't, you don't live, you don't practice what you preach. So what is true religion? What is false religion? Well, let's see what Jesus has to say to these Pharisees. In verse 2, he says, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, he's saying they take on the authority of Moses. These guys are standing up there speaking for Moses. They're taking the law of Moses and they're teaching you what it says and what it means. And so Jesus said concerning that, verse 3, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. So the Pharisees were basically individuals who preached but they didn't walk and live what they preached. They told everybody, this is what you should do, but they weren't doing it themselves. And that is where all hypocrisy begins. Everything that I know, everything that I declare to someone else, am I doing it myself? That's the question. To preach one thing and practice another is hypocrisy. In James chapter 1, verse 22, he says there, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. So if I hear the word, but then I don't do what I know is the truth, then I deceive myself. So what I preach, do I do. What you tell other people to do, do you do it? You tell your kids, don't do that, son. Don't do that, honey. But do you do it? That is the question you have to ask. If, if they see you doing what they, you are telling them not to do, they will look at you and not respect you because they will count it as hypocrisy. I have teenagers come into my office all the time and tell me that about their own family because their mom or their dad is not doing what they profess to be doing. And their, their children see it. So this is a serious thing. It's not only serious for your family, but it's serious for every aspect of your life. Now, all that they teach, Jesus said, observe. You do that. He's not referring now to the traditions of the Pharisees, because remember Jesus said that these traditions were completely contrary to the law of God. He's talking here only about the law of Moses, because they sit in the seat of Moses. In Matthew 15, verses 1 through 3, and then verse 6, Jesus said this, the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. So how did Jesus answer this? They, they're asking, well, yeah, how come your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? And Jesus said, he responded, Why do you transgress the commandment of God? because of your tradition. And then in verse 6, he says, Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. So, is what I live by, the truth that I live by, is it, is it God's truth? Or is it my tradition? Which is it? See, many times when people come in for counseling, they say, well, see, this is the way... This is what I've always done. This is, this is what my parents taught me. This is what I learned when I grew up in the church. And I have to say, well, but that's not biblical. Nowhere in the scripture are you going to find that concept or that teaching or that commandment. That's a tradition of man. And that tradition of man can actually end up violating and keeping you 
from obeying the commandments of God. So you have to be very clear on this, and you have to look clearly at what you're doing and what you believe. Now, you may be sitting there this morning thinking, well, Steve, I am a sinner. Buddy, I, I, I'm, I'm not perfect. I mean, if you, you think I'm perfect, boy, you, you're talking to the wrong person. I know you're not perfect. And I'm not talking and telling you you need to be perfect because you will never be. Remember Romans 3.23. It says, all have sinned. That's referring to the past. And falls short of the glory of God. That's referring to presently. Because that word falls short is in the present tense. So I have sinned and I am continually falling short of God's glory. I am a sinner. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. So am I just letting you off the hook now and saying, well, you know, since you're not perfect, you can just do whatever you please. No. No. I'm not. You see, the point is, even though we are not perfect, yes, even though we miss the mark of God's glory, you see, the intent is, where's my heart? The best way to see the balance of this truth is to look at when Jesus spoke to the Pharisee and the publican, the tax collector. Remember that story? In Luke chapter 18, verses 13 and 14, where he speaks to the publican. See, after the Pharisee had stood there and, and he prayed, Oh, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other men. And I'm especially not like this tax collector. Uh, I, you know, I give, I do all these things. And he, you know, laid out his list of all the external things that he did. But then it says concerning the tax collector... He, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So this guy's a sinner. He's not perfect. And he went down justified to his house. How did he get that accomplished? He just humbled himself. He acknowledged his sin. So when you see places where you're not living in accordance to what you preach or profess, what happens? Do you say, eh, you know, I'm just a sinner. You know, the Lord will forgive. Or am Am I smote in my heart? Do I beat my breast? Do I humble myself? Do I mourn for my sin and ask God's forgiveness and ask for His help and His grace to change me? You see, if I have that attitude, then I am not a pretender. I am not a hypocrite. I am somebody who is honest with himself and I am I'm serious about change. So if that's your heart, then you have true religion. You are a true worshiper. If that is not the case, then you are a pretender. You are, have false religion. And in the degree that you have that humbleness and that you mourn for your sin... And you cry out to God for His grace will be in the same manner that you will experience victory. That is the freedom and the joy that really comes from understanding these truths. So, secondly, the Pharisees here in verse 4 did not really want to help anybody. They just wanted to control people. Verse 4, they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and they lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. In other words, these guys love to tell people what to do, but they didn't want to help 
in one, in even the simplest ways. They wouldn't take one finger to help another individual. Now this is obviously false religion. Because who is our helper? Who does the scripture declare our helper is? Well, in Psalm 10, verse 14, there it says of the Lord, the helpless commits himself to you. You are the helper of the fatherless. You see, he is our helper. In the New Testament, of course, the Holy Spirit is called our helper. So God the Father wants to help me. And he has sent the Holy Spirit to live inside me to help me and to change me and to transform me. And that will make me a helper of other individuals. You see, I won't just declare to people, oh, yeah, you need to take care of that. You need to do that. But how can I help you take care of that or do that? That's the question. The heavy burdens that were, are described here that are laid on these men's shoulders were the traditions of the elders. It's not the Word of God. It's not the commandments of God. They are not a burden or burdensome. The Scripture is very clear that God's Word is not to burden you. It's to set you free. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 3, it says, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome or grievous. So God's commandments are never going to grieve or become burdensome to a person. If you feel like, oh, you know, what a bummer, I have to do this, you know, my either what my thinking is concerning what I'm supposed to do is wrong, or my heart is wrong. One of the two. And so God's call is always to set us free. This is what Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30. He said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And then he ends with, My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. So any burden he lays upon me is not to destroy me. It's to set me free. His yoke is easy. It's easier than anything out there. It is his way. His way will set me free. So are you a taskmaster or a burden bearer? You know, I say this to those of you husbands and wives. You know, we, we love to, you know, command our wives or command our husbands. Do this, do that. Well, are you a servant in your own house? I think that's the question. What is and where is your heart? It's a very important issue. You see, it says in Galatians 6, 2, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Bear one another's burdens. These guys, that was the furthest thing from their eyes, the furthest thing from their mind. They didn't want to bear anybody's burdens, but they sure wanted to tell people what to do. So which is the case with you? Taskmaster or burden bearer? There's, you're only one or the other. In Philippians 4.3, there Paul ends his epistle with, I urge you, true companion, help these women who labored with me. So the individual that he wrote this epistle to, he's saying, help these women who labored with me. Help them. Why? Because that's what a true worshiper does. That's what somebody with true religion will do. And so a very important aspect to truly walking with him. Number three, the Pharisees loved the recognition, the honor of men. 
They loved to be called rabbi, rabbi. They made broad their phylacteries. The phylacteries were these little boxes that they they put and strapped to their head or to their arms. And inside these boxes was the Word of God. And they made them as big as they could so everybody would see it. They made their tassels on their robes really long so everybody would know that they were a rabbi, that they were a teacher. In other words, these guys were looking for the honor and the praise and the applause of men. Now again, this again is, the, is what causes hypocrisy. It's one of the key fundamentals of hypocrisy, of being an actor, is I want to be seen as a spiritual guy, a spiritual woman. You see, if that is your motive, then you, you're, you're a pretender. There is only one individual that is worth doing anything for, and that is the one who sees in secret. In Matthew 6, verse 1 through 4, Jesus said, Take heed that you do not your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Is this your motivation? Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing that your charitable deed may be in secret, that your Father who sees in secret will himself reward you openly. In other words, he's saying, don't even think, don't even let it stay in your mind what this hand is doing or that hand is doing. Don't even think about it. Don't dwell on it. Because that's where it starts. You see, it's that little thought that goes through your mind. Well, I... What will they think if I do that? Or if I say this? What will happen? Oh, I've got to make sure that they see this. You see, that is something that you think about in your mind, and that's where you have to kill it. That's where you have to deal with it. Because that creates the behavior. The motivation comes in a thought. And... That is where you need to deal with it if you're to ever be transformed. This motivation to be seen by men, Jesus said, is what kills your faith. It destroys your ability to trust him and to walk in faith. In John 5.44, Jesus said, How can you believe? How can you ever walk in faith? who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God. There's only one guy that you can ever get honor from, and that is from him. If you're seeking it from people, you will never get it. This is what Matthew Henry said, one of my favorite authors. He said, honor is like a shadow that flees from those who pursue it, but follows those who flee from it. Let me read it again. Honor is like a shadow that flees from those who pursue it, but follows those who flee from it. I mean, what a powerful, insightful truth. I mean, this is the wisdom of Solomon. It's the wisdom that God gave to Solomon in the Proverbs. This simple illustration. I mean, think of it, your shadow. You run from your shadow, it follows you. You chase your shadow, you'll never catch it. I mean, simple truth. But that's the way honor is. So if you pursue it, 
trying to get it from people, you will never receive it. If you're always thinking, well, he slighted me, she slighted me, they, they just, I deserve more respect than that. You're seeking something that you're not going to get. Don't do it. The only person that is worth seeking honor from is the, your Heavenly Father. He sees what you do. And I would encourage you as often and as, as many times as you can, do whatever you do, do it in secret. Do it so that He is the only one who does see it. As much as lies in you. And when that is your motivation, do you know what will happen? The Lord will honor you. He will bless you. Because you've got the right motivation. Anything other than this is absolutely insincere. It's false religion. In 2 Corinthians 2.17, Paul there said concerning the false teachers, he said, For we are not, as so many, peddling the word of God. Why does he use this term, peddling the word of God? He's saying these people that were around in his day were preaching for money. They were preaching because they were making good bucks. And he said, We are not, as so many, peddling the word of God. But as of sincerity, and there it is. But as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Now notice here that Paul is even saying, look, I'm saying this to you. I'm saying this to you in the sight of God. God knows my heart and knows why I'm saying it. He goes, these men are not sincere. God knows. The sincerity is what, that's the, that's the opposite of hypocrisy. Sincerity. You see, that is what the publican's heart was declaring. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I, I'm the chief sinner. I know my sin. God, have mercy on me and change me and help me. That is sincerity. And that individual goes to his home justified. And so this is what you have to be after, is sincerity, not false religion or the applause of men, the honor of men. You will not receive it. In Acts chapter 4, verses 18 through 20, there it says, they called them, this is the Pharisees, and they commanded the disciples not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. I mean, these guys are bold. They are incredibly bold. They are willing to be persecuted. And why? Well, he states it right here whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you. You see, that was where their motivation was. Their motivation was, what is right in God's sight? And the more you are motivated by what is right in God's sight, whether anybody else sees it or not, the more you will follow Him and be a true disciple of Christ. But it starts with that motivation in your heart. It continues with you being a real helper to people. Not looking to lay some trip on somebody, but trying to help others follow Christ just like you're following Him. It's doing in secret what you know is the truth. Whether anybody sees you doing it or not makes no difference to you. All you're interested in is that you're doing what you're telling other people to do. And when you fail, you come humbly and acknowledge it and say, Lord, forgive me. Give me grace and help me to be sincere because that is the proof 
of your sincerity. Amen? Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we ask that you would work that work in us this morning. Lord, that we would be men and women who are real with you by the private obedience that we display. Lord, that we'll be real with others as we, we help them sincerely because we love, because we care. Lord, that we would be real with you in private. Lord, that we would have the right motivation for whatever we do. And Lord, when we are otherwise minded, Lord, reveal this to us so that we might repent, that we might humble ourselves and allow you to change us, to forgive us. Lord, make us men and women who are sincerely following you. Lord, we believe you to do that. We believe you're doing it right now. Bring that conviction upon us, Lord. Transform us. Lord, make us true worshipers with true religion. Thank you, Lord. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, I want to give you that opportunity right where you sit this morning to respond to him, to become a true worshiper. All you got to do is ask for his forgiveness. That's it. Acknowledge your sin. Beat your breast. Ask for his mercy. And you know what? He will forgive you. You will leave this place this morning justified in his sight, forgiven. But that's what it requires. Are you willing to do that this morning? If you are, I want you to pray with me right now, right where you sit. Just open your heart to say, Lord, forgive me. I acknowledge my sin. I have broken your law. Jesus, come in, take over my life. I want to be your disciple. I want to be a true worshiper. Fill me with your Holy Spirit at this very moment. Are you praying that prayer? If you prayed with me just now, I want you to acknowledge that you prayed with me by just lifting your hand or a simple acknowledgement. God bless you. Who else? God bless. Who else? God bless you. Lord, we pray you touch these hearts, Lord. Lord, the, the honesty that is here, Lord, the acknowledgement, Lord, you, you know. You see it. And that's all that counts, Lord. Lord, I pray you transform these hearts this morning. Transform these lives. Lord, by your power, by your grace, Lord, I know you can do that. Lord, and keep doing it in every single one of our lives. Transform us, Lord. Make us the lights you want us to be in this dark world. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.